Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by Nexus. Building a support a creator program is something all live service game developers should be doing. But without the right engineering bandwidth or marketing expertise, doing so can be a challenge. Nexus's creator program in a box makes it easy for game devs to build and manage world-class creator programs, driving significant growth in conversion, ARPU, retention, and LTV. Nexus has partnered with incredible live service publishers like Capcom, Grinding Gear Games, Hi Res, Ninja Kiwi, and more, and would love to help you, our Navic Gaming Podcast listeners, do the same. If interested in learning more, simply head to nexus.gg slash Novik. There you can learn more about the efficacy of support of creator programs and discover how to easily build your own. Again, that's nexus.gg slash Novik, or check out the link in the show notes. And with that, let's jump into the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Novik Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Ovori. Today, we have a fantastic guest on the pod, someone I've been wanting to get on the show ever since we chatted at GDC. So this is the better part of half a year ago now. We sat across from each other at an industry event, and over a family-style fried chicken dinner, we got talking about Web3, the state of the industry, what we're excited about, what's working, what's not. And I knew that we had to get uh, him on the pod to try to recreate that discussion, except maybe minus the fried food. Uh, our guest today is none other than Sean Ryan who many of our listeners will surely know as the face of Facebook's gaming business, which he was hired to build out in 2011, and when, which he ran for about a decade, with responsibilities eventually encompassing several other very relevant initiatives for this pod, including Facebook's forays into blockchain. Uh, and before Facebook, Sean uh, was an entrepreneur, uh, founded a variety of gaming and gaming-adjacent companies, and even worked on Metaverse stuff, uh, it turns out. We'll have to go into that a little bit, Sean, later in the episode, uh, before Metaverse was cool. Uh, now, Sean is the founder and CEO of Aqua.xyz, which offers an embedded Web3 marketplace for game clients, as well as offering some simple classic first-party games like Solitaire, Pool, and Ludo. Sean, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Nico. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. All right. Well, that out of the way, let's get right into it. Um, and so, yes, Sean, I just gave a quick intro uh, based on your LinkedIn and our conversations, but mm -hmm. um, I know our, our listeners love hearing from our guests. Uh, what their backgrounds are and what their kind of aha moment was coming into Web3. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your journey into Web3 and your background in, in gaming and, of course, uh, as the face of Facebook's gaming business? Sure, Nico. I appreciate it. I've been doing this for a long time, so I'll try and keep it short. Uh, because I'm in my mid-50s, I was a gamer when I was quite young. So this is back to the days of Asteroids and Space Invader on in arcades and then moved into the Atari 2600, as it, which is the earliest game console, followed by my first PC was uh, an Apple II, an Apple IIc and an Apple IIe where we played Wizardry. So that was, then I went on to business school, went on to undergraduate, uh, played a bunch of games, came out, worked in retail, worked in banking, went to business school, but gaming was always the passion. And so when I came out of business school in 96, 1996, broadband modems were just starting to occur. Before this, we had dial-up modems. And therefore, gaming, as always, was the first type of innovation starting to occur because gaming always leads in terms of new technologies in the last 20 years. And so I ended up going to one of the early online game companies called Sega Soft Networks, which was the online division of Sega, the uh, Japanese video game company, where we built a service called Heat.net, which was one of the first online game services that allowed you to play games like Quake. Uh, online against your friends. Because before that, when I was in business school, the only way to play against your friends was to play on an actual LAN. So I would go down to the business school LAN, into the business school uh, area, and just play games where all my classmates were doing work. And my now wife, who I met in business school, used to make fun of me for that. And 25 years later, we're still doing this. So so gaming was uh, where I went to Sega, was there two years before it, uh, before it somewhat imploded with the death of the founder. 
I went into music because that was the most innovative thing for the next eight or nine years, a company called Listen.com. But gaming was always what pulled me back. And so at the same time I was there, we did a, 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 we did a social media company of sorts. We did a karaoke company uh, and ended up starting a, what well, today we would call a metaverse company. In those days, we called it an avatar and virtual world company with my current CTO, John, actually, here at Aqua. And we were early. We were 20 years too early. I mean, avatars, virtual worlds, there were no smartphones. Uh, there was no ways to monetize. But it had a lot of usage. It was a super amount of fun. You could see the future, that you would have an avatar represent you. You put that avatar in games. You would interact with other folks. Uh, and then we started a social casino company that we sold to an Australian company called VGW. And then at that point, uh, I went off to look around for other things to do. I ended up in Moscow, Russia. Uh, I don't speak Russian. I have no background in Russia. I ended up running a, a large uh, uh, social media company there called Live Journal. Was there for a year before coming back to the States. Went to News Corp for six months to help start their interactive group. And I'd still be there. And I met a guy at a party, classic Silicon Valley story, who worked at Facebook. I didn't know anybody at Facebook. Facebook had just launched its platform. And when I say platform, it, it opened up its, in those days, a few hundred million users to other types of developers. And Facebook at the time, Mark uh, Zuckerberg thought that it would be news and distance learning and education and all sorts of coolness. And of course, thanks to Mark Pincus and Zynga, it turned out to be 99% games. Because as we, the theme we'll talk about here, games are always at the cutting edge, taking advantage of new innovation, whether it's bandwidth, latency, processing power, GPUs, et cetera. And so all of a sudden, Facebook had this burgeoning business on their platform that was all about games and no one at the company knew anything about games. It just wasn't their background. So that's how I fortunately came to be at that company to start the games business. So not the product. I came up through the business side, the partnership side. And I was there for 11 years and ran what was at its peak a $4 billion business on the PC uh, on games. That's Farmville, Candy Crush, et cetera. That migrated to mobile over time, of course. Uh, and then uh, ended up running the payments business, the crypto business, the commerce platform, developer platform, a bunch of other things that were there. Had a great run until about 18 months ago, the Web3 bug bit me. And it was just, why be in Web3? And the answer is, we think this is the next big shift in gaming. And I needed to be there. And that's why I ended up coming to Aqua. But we can talk about that in more detail. Awesome. Um, very efficient. Uh, you, you have one of the, the longest and most interesting careers, I think, of any other guests <laughs> that we've had on the show. I, I don't know about that, but uh, but I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think absolutely fascinating. And this is why we hit it off, I think, at that that dinner, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, back at GDC. A lot in common, you know, we've got the social casino thing. We've got, obviously got the Facebook Zynga connection. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, we share this, this thesis, which is that gaming tends to lead um, new technologies, new platforms. It tends to be one of the things that goes first, tests up what's possible, oftentimes becomes the biggest monetizer. I mean, we saw that with mm -hmm. mobile, we saw that with Facebook Canvas, you know, back in the day. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we share a lot of the same theses around Web3 and what that can bring to gaming. Um, so my next question really is, you know, what is it about Web3 that really got you excited? You know, you've alluded to the fact that you see this as, mm -hmm. you know, the next big thing. Obviously, you've been through a lot of the... Uh, big things that have happened, you know, mobile, um, you know, Facebook Canvas, uh, before that, you know, a lot of the mm -hmm. startups that you looked at. Um, but what is it about Web3 that made you think, okay, I have to get out of Facebook and I got to do this thing for myself. The bug has bitten me. I'm going to go and build this. So throughout the history of gaming, there, have been, there are platform transitions that take place every five to seven years. And it's relatively like clockwork. And so when I first started, we had cartridges or CD-ROMs. And they were single player games that you bought at GameStop if they were used or new at, uh, at Walmart or Best Buy, you came out and played them. That migrated to uh, Flash, so single player social games. They were digitally delivered though, and that was the innovation. They were pretty similar games, not even as rich in many cases. That then migrated to Facebook Social, which we're familiar with from Farmville and Candy Crush, that again, were not the deepest, most high def games that were in HD necessarily but broaden the horizon with both free to play as well as digitally delivered and social. And then that moved to mobile and mobile brought a lot of what it brought with it from Facebook social, but added the fact that the device could be with you anywhere. And again, expanded the pie to now 3 billion, 3.2 billion monthly users. And we believe my CTO and I, John, that web three is that next wave, that asset ownership, the ability that consumers can buy, sell, and trade their own assets as opposed to leaving them inside the game 
is a seminal change for gaming that is enough to provoke that next wave of new companies. It doesn't mean they'll all be radically different. If anything, new early days of new platforms look a lot like the last platform. They just have slightly different angles, whether it's social or digitally delivered, or in this case, asset ownership. And for me, that is where small companies can become successful because in a classic innovator's dilemma, the large companies don't see this business as either big enough to start or disruptive to their own business. So why would they do it? It's just like a years ago at GDC, I was at this amazing Legends of Game Designer dinner. I mean, everybody who's anybody, I was in awe of the, the, the game designers who were there. And they said, there's never going to be a AAA free-to-play game. It just doesn't work. The biz- that business does not work. And now you've got Fortnite. Now you've got you know uh, War Warzone. Now you've got. It doesn't mean the other business goes away. I want to be clear. It just expands the business, and that's what we always want. And I think Web three gaming will expand the business by getting us back to the idea that you can own your assets. And when you want to change strategies or change games, you can sell them or trade them or buy them or sell them and get some of your money back and defray the costs of your next strategy or your next game. And that is more innovative than people think. It's what we used to have in the physical CD world. In the old days, if I didn't have a lot of money, I would go to GameStop. I would buy a used CD-ROM for $35 or $40 because I couldn't afford a new one. I would go home and play it for 30 hours. I would come back and sell it for 12 I'd be annoyed that I didn't get 25 and I'd take that money and buy the next thing. That's how normal people work. You wouldn't buy a car if you couldn't sell it. You wouldn't buy a house if you couldn't sell it. You shouldn't be playing games and accumulating all these assets if you can't do something with them. Yeah, so you use the phrase, uh, more innovative than people think. Um, And uh, as I'm sure you well know, there's kind of a wave of cynicism uh, Mm -hmm. from from some parts of the industry, certainly some of the Web2 folks, uh, but even Mm -hmm. internally, you know, uh, Web3 developers. And there's this big question as to whether Web3 technologies, you know, you're you're talking specifically about asset ownership, but there's all kinds of other uh, Web3 Mm -hmm. technologies that are enabled through blockchain and, and, you know, decentralization and what have you. We'll get to that question in a second. But first, the cynics say, you know, even if Web3 technologies work in gaming, um, they're not this big revolution. It's not analogous to the free-to-play revolution. Mm-hmm. It's not analogous to um, going online, for example, from, from you know, physical products. It's more like a developer toolkit. You know, it's a, it's a set of technologies mm-hmm. that you can use in different ways, but it's not a platform in and of itself. It's not a revolution in and of itself. Um, you seem to disagree. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, why do you say more innovative than people think? Why do you think asset ownership is more innovative, more, oh, excuse me, more innovative um, than people actually give it credit for? Well, one is we've always had asset ownership in the physical world. I buy a book, I can go sell it, give it away, do whatever I want. Only in the digital world did that go away. So the history of mankind is the history of asset ownership. Only this new recent time is where I actually am renting these assets, whether it's my songs on iTunes or my, uh, or my assets in a game. So this is relatively recent. But what I say is anytime we've offered this digitally in games, demand has been overwhelming. So let's start with IGE, which was founded by my friend Brock Pierce about 17 years ago, allowed uh, people to gold farm on World of Warcraft in tier two cities in China, level up the accounts, sell the accounts on eBay. The company collapsed, I want to be clear, but not due to lack of demand. There was massive demand. The problem was it violated terms of service. The games weren't built for it and had massive fraud because there was not a way to do a trustless transaction. Wow, like we have in blockchain right now. Then we go to the Diablo 3 auction house. Overwhelming demand. Game wasn't built for it, wasn't ready for it, had to shut it down, not due to lack of demand, but because they didn't build the game in that approach. So anytime we've offered consumers the ability to do this, they've stormed into it. If you look at the Reddit groups about FIFA on a console, how you can figure out how to trade in the gray market cards, or if you look at some of the other games, more innovative games, whether it's the RuneScapes or uh, Ultima Online, which had this ability with UGC, you see lots of demand. And that so the consumer demand is there. It's just that we have stifled it through uh, digital technologies and not enable it the way it could because we didn't have the right tech at the time. Blockchain, and we can talk about the more uh, innovative maybe parts of blockchain, asset ownership, meaning trustless transactions in a secure manner, to me is the secret sauce here. We'll eventually get to massively new things like you do later in in a platform cycle. But for right now, that alone is innovative, although it's also the same thing we had for thousands of years before we got to digital. Mm. Uh 
interesting. So you're, you're really picking the asset ownership as the thing that uh, differentiates blockchain, the trustless transactions. Um, other game developers have looked at other parts of the mm-hmm. Web3 stack, if you will. I'm using it a very loose sense of the, the word. Um, you know, some of the most maxi decentralization maxis, you know, they talk about things like DAOs, um, mm-hmm. uh, tokenized economies, fully on-chain games, those kinds of things. Um, what do you think about those pieces? Are, are those necessary or, or are you just saying digital asset, asset ownership on its own is absolutely the thing? It's, that's the, the killer app. Um, as it as it were. So I have a couple of responses. One is earlier early in a platform cycle, and again, I've been through five platform cycles, uh, as we talked about, you want to focus on what is the killer differentiation. Later in a platform cycle, three, four, five years later, you start to get more innovation on top of that platform. You can't do it early on because the platform's morphing so quickly. So Fortnite, which people think is you know, AAA free to play, didn't come the first time we enabled AAA or free to play. It came years into the cycle. So my first response is asset ownership is more than enough because it's true player value. And the way I look at platforms, I look at what is the value to the gamer? What, is, what do they feel that makes this better that I'm going to leave my existing Web2 happiness and go to this new innovative, maybe not as good in some ways, classic innovators still on not everything is as good in the new platform, but something is much better. And so asset ownership is clearly that. When I look at DAOs and tokens and decentralized and a bunch of the maxis that are out there, it may or may not be interesting and may or not be uh, at a late night philosophical discussion, fascinating about censorship and God knows what else. It doesn't help the gamer. Gamers don't get up and say, wow, I want a decentralized game. Wow, if I could only have a DAO. What they do is say, if I could own my assets, that would be great because I could buy, sell, trade them. There's all sorts of things I could do. It doesn't mean I don't believe in that innovation like on-chain games. So on-chain games, I have some discussions with, tell me the consumer benefit to on-chain games. Well, super cool. It's great. You can have every every NFT on there and all that. I'm like, you still haven't explained to me the benefit. So that's how I tend to look at it. I think in five years in Web3, we will get on-chain games and more decentralization and DAOs that are super interesting and not just fake. But for right now, we're overcomplicating this. When you switch platforms to a new platform, you must simplify, not overcomplicate. Web3 folks have made Web3 so complicated, it is too hard to use. We at Aqua spend a lot of time trying to bring back as much as Web2 as possible, but keep the core differentiator, which is asset ownership. Other than that, it should feel like a Web2 uh, asset. Not everybody agrees. I want to be crystal clear. We think that's the way to a mass market. So do I think on-chain games and DAOs and decentralized platforms and so on will show up at some point? Yes. But I really want to see a benefit to gamers. That's how I kind of run my life. Otherwise, gamers won't switch. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting uh, the point you make about uh, it's almost like the complicatedness, complications, the confusion around Web3 and having these tokenized economies that have incredibly complicated flow charts and MIT economists can't figure them out, you know, mm-hmm. spreadsheets that are like, uh, you know, a terabyte in size because they're all yeah. the formulas are, are running. It's almost as if, that might be a little too much for gamers. Uh, how does that help them? So that's an interesting point you make. They're really going back to the basics. Um, and, and well, I tend to look as gaming. I tend to look as gaming as entertainment. I think mm. we lose track, especially with the brief kind of foray into play to earn, which is obviously complete nonsense. Um, is gaming is entertainment? When I go to see Serena Williams play tennis, I'm not there to make money. She's there to make money because she's the pro. I'm there to pay money to be entertained. When I go to the movie theater, I'm not there to make money. The movie theater is making money. The people on screen are making money. I'm not. I'm paying to be entertained. Gaming is the same thing. Will there be a small set of gamers who make money through either great trading or through uh, being esports heroes? Of course. But at the end of the day, you pay to be entertained. And that's what we should always come back to. Gaming is entertainment for the vast 99% of the world. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. I, and I've actually, you know, said this myself, and I think we probably actually uh, agreed on this <laughs> during our dinner. Um, but, you know, the way I see a lot of what's happened in Web3 so far, Web3 Gaming, is it's coming out of your financial budget, because you're looking to make a profit, right? And so then it's not a game, then it's not entertainment, then it's trading, right? And people are prepared to put a lot of money down and spend, you know, $10,000 on some NFT from a game if they think they're going to make a return. And, you know, many did for a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's not really sustainable. And it's also not the reason why most people play games, to your point. Uh, You know, uh, gaming comes out of your entertainment budget. And that's a very different kind of budget. You're not going to spend $1,000 on an NFT in a game. 
um, never mind $100,000 uh, for an NFT in a game, um, because that's not how entertainment works, right? For the vast majority of people. Uh, you're going to spend five bucks, 10 so bucks, maybe, you know, for that experience. You're going to use it the same way. You're going to value it the same way you value like a movie ticket. What is two hours of my time being entertainment in a movie theater? cost me, cost me 10, 15 bucks, right? Or 20 bucks if you're in the Bay Area. Um, so that's kind of the, the frame of reference I think most people, most gamers will use for gaming. They'll think, oh, this should cost a buck or five bucks or if it's a microtransaction, 99 cents, right? Um, and so I think that's the thing that a lot of people did miss up until this point where Web3 seemed like there was this, all this money to be made, but not from gaming because gaming is entertainment from financial transactions, from speculation, from trading. Yes, but that's not yeah. games. Well, also, but I also want to bring people back to the fact that even at Facebook, uh, I would get a call from legal when someone spent more than $10,000 in a month on Facebook games, Farmville, Candy Crush, et cetera. And I got those calls all the time. So it's not like people don't whales, what we call whales or VIPs or heavy spenders, don't spend money in free to play. The general rule of thumb in free to play is 1% of your consumers are 50% of your revenue or more. So there are people who spend thousands upon thousands of dollars in free to play. And so there's no reason they shouldn't do that in Web3. But you're right. The general entry price point, and this is one of my frustrations with blockchain or Web3 pricing, is when people say, I'm going to pre-sale you land, I'm going to pre-sale you a character, it's going to cost $100 to $500 or more. That's not actually how gaming works. How gaming works is you start, I sell you a $4.99 pack, which by the way is the most popular price in mobile. And then over time, as you get more engaged in this game, I, I move you up and then you're spending $99 on a pack or more, those types of things. If you want to, if you don't want to, don't. And so I think in Web3, I agree, the financialization of Web3 gaming is what can be a bit of a turnoff. It feels extractive. Uh, it feels like the games aren't very good. Now that having been said, that is the identical pushback I got when we launched Facebook games through Zynga and, and other ones 14 years ago. Same, same guy saying, these games are extractive. All they do is try and get you to make money. The games aren't very good, which they weren't, by the way, in the beginning. Mafia Wars, et cetera, were not good games. But it evolved quickly to become a much more entertaining group, and it brought many new gamers in. So that we're now at three, more than 3 billion monthly gamers. When I started in the business 25 years ago, there's probably 100 million. So gaming has dramatically expanded. And each time we've added new revenue loops, new easier ways to get into the game, new types of gameplay mechanics. And we believe Web3 is part of that because it means that a bunch of everyday folks not trying to become Wall Street traders will be able to own their assets and buy and sell them and make some of the money back if they can when they want to switch strategies or switch games. That's really powerful in the real world. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, you mentioned uh, uh, whales and you mentioned uh, mafia wars. Uh, fun fact for you, which you, you may already know this, but maybe our listeners don't. Um, back in, I think it was 2009, 8, 9, 10, in that time frame, uh, mafia wars uh, was Zynga's biggest game. Uh, Snoop mm -hmm. Dogg, uh, famously, was a huge mafia wars fan. Uh, and at that time, it wasn't possible to spend more than, I think, $99. Uh, I mean, Facebook didn't <laughs> allow you to spend more than $99 yep, in a single transaction. True. And Snoop wanted, to, Snoop wanted to spend a lot more than that. So we had a special phone number. I'm not making mm -hmm. this up. We had a special phone number uh, that Snoop could call, or one of Snoop's people could call, where we would then uh, accept a wire transfer for like $10,000 or you know, yep. even bigger amounts of money when Snoop wanted to get his game on and, and play Mafia Wars and dominate. Um, and so, yes, there are absolutely uh, whales out there who will happily spend a lot of money, including jumping through a lot of hoops. I mean, you know, it was impossible yep. to spend 10 grand. They were prepared to go above and beyond. So for sure, there are people in Web3 that are going to go jumping through the hoops um, just to play the game and to spend that money, not just for the financial um, aspect. But again, I think we both agree, the vast majority of gamers, when they enter a game, they're not saying, I'm going to spend $10,000 just to try this game out, i.e. buy an NFT. Um, I'm going to play for free or I'll pay 10 bucks or whatever. Um, and then progressively go up the, up the chain. All right, well, we've spent, talked a lot about uh, kind of general Web3 stuff here. Well, let's dive a little bit into to Aqua, because Aqua obviously is the reason why you wanted to come into Web3. Um, what is Aqua now? And I, I know it's morphed a little bit in the 18 months that you guys have been building it. Um, what did it start as and, and what is it now? Sure. So Aqua was an incubated venture from a firm called Digital.xyz that really was about how can we make a better gaming marketplace? OpenSea is an amazing marketplace, but it's a general purpose one. And gaming is big enough to deserve its own marketplace. 
just like Twitch is big enough for gamers versus YouTube. YouTube, they're both still successful, but Twitch is aimed at gamers initially, at least. So originally we inherited a B2C, so direct-to-consumer marketplace, aimed primarily at Gods Unchained because one of uh, the investors was a top Gods Unchained NFT holder. And that was during the bull run about 18 months ago. And then obviously that fell off. FTX collapsed, Ethereum, other things went down, and we went through the reset in crypto. And so John and I, my CTO and I, looked and said, okay, now that we've been in the business three or six months, what, what is Web3 missing that Web2 has? And it really came down to what you and I've talked about, Nico, is how do we make this easier? That's been our overriding mantra. How do we make it easier for gamers to come to Web3? To enjoy the advantages of asset ownership, but still to make it otherwise feel like Web2. So one of the ways to do that was because John and I both built platforms before, was to take our marketplace, which was quite well received, but relatively small, and embed it into other people's apps. So that's the first thing we did was take aqua.xyz, make sure it could be available as an embeddable marketplace inside a Unity or Unreal app. So that if you were right now, if you're in Web3 and you click on a marketplace link, you leave the app in 99% of cases and go somewhere else. That's both bad from a friction perspective and bad from a security perspective in Web3. You want to stay within the app. That's also what you're used to from Web2, from iOS or Android. So that's the first thing we built was let's build a good marketplace that gamers enjoy that's more than about price. It's about how do you use the assets, not just about price, because this is not about traders. This is about gamers. Gamers want to know how to use an asset. Why should they buy it? How can they package it? How do I buy a whole deck? How do I play a whole strategy? Those are the things, the types of features we launched with Aqua that we now bring to our partners in the embeddable marketplace uh, space. So we started with Gods Unchained, where right now, if you click on the marketplace links, it goes out to us. Soon it will be inside the game, and there are many more coming after that because it's a better experience. Then we looked at it and said, okay, what is the other pain point? It's about wallets. We didn't really want to build wallets, but right now it's really scary for a new consu- a gamer to come in and be set up on MetaMask or other types of classic Web3 wallets. It's con- confusing jargon. You have to buy Ethereum. So when I used to run Facebook credits, if you wanted to buy Farmville cash, you had to buy Facebook credits to buy Farmville cash. But you didn't want to do that. You just wanted the Farmville cash. So eventually you got rid of it. In Web3, it's worse. You want to buy a plus five sword. We make you buy Ethereum. Then maybe move it to an L2, which is a confusing term to anybody in the normal world, by the way. And then let you buy uh, the plus five uh, sword and fees and confusion along the way. So that's when we introduced our wallet. And as of today, actually introduced a product called Aqua Direct as of today, which allows a gamer to directly put down their credit or debit card and buy the NFT to buy the digital asset and transfer it to their wallet. We do a bunch of the work on the background that hides that from the consumer. But realistically, we buy and resell the asset to the consumer so that it's a much easier way to get into gaming. We shouldn't make everybody have to be financial analysts in order to play games. So I think not everybody agrees. People, Some people want to make it complicated and have all sorts of, as we talked about, decentralization and things like that. Most gamers just want it to be really easy and they want to use their credit or debit card to buy the game, the assets of the game they want to play. I mean, ideally, they want to use their thumbprint or their you know face ID. Like <laughs> taking it to, that is true Taking well. it to the next level. So that, that's really where, where the natural endpoint for all of this is. I mean, the, the, the friction has to go away because consumers are so used to, in their normal lives, being able to unlock things and make purchases simply by looking at their screen or you know putting their thumbprint down. Um, Completely agree. So... Uh, one of the things that uh, initially got me quite excited be- uh, was the mm-hmm. fact that you have, you, you know, during the dinner at GDC, you, you were telling me about some of your first party games, and you've chosen to go down a path of making very, very simple classic games like uh, Solitaire Pool, Ludo, um, mm-hmm. and you have a, in my opinion, fairly unique, at least at the time it was, and I think it probably still is fairly unique, approach to NFTs in those games. Uh, and I, I thought it was a really interesting and novel approach uh, including also looking at the markets that you were, you were targeting at the time. Uh, tell us more about your first party games. How do they fit into the strategy? Sure. And then how the NFTs in those games actually work. Well, as we looked around, there aren't, right now, if you look at the Web3 gaming landscape, it's a pretty hardcore audience of who's, who people are building games for. And so there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great. There's too many CCGs or collectible card games because everybody thinks NFT, they think collectible card game. If you look in the Web2 world, there's really only one or two successful collectible card games in the entire world. But 
when we looked at this, we said, okay, in every platform transition, I always come back to that. What are successful games, at least for a period of time? And so it comes back to the classics, Yahoo Games, Pogo, all the way up through flat Facebook, early social, all the way up through. And it's games like Solitaire. It's games like uh, Monopoly. And it's games like Ludo, which is big in Southeast Asia. Here you would know it as Sorry or Parcheesi. And so those games are massive, billions of downloads in, in mobile. But what do you put the twist on it when you move to Web3? What is that twist? Because when you switch platforms with, with games that are similar to the previous platform, why would people leave to go to the new one? And our thesis was that you could create a set of interchangeable cross-game NFTs or assets, we call them boosts, that you could use in any of the games. And the way we looked at it was just look at Uno, if you're familiar with the card game. You look at those types of boosts that are in turn-based uh, player versus player games. It's skip. It's reverse. It's uh, these types of things that you're used to in games. In our case, slow down the timer because there's a timer in all these games that you can use these boosts across the three games and soon to be in other people's games that we thought was enough of a unique twist that we would that we'd be able to move people from their successful Web 2 games into Web 3. That has not happened at scale yet. I want to be crystal clear. I think the only proof point is I should not be the executive producer of games. That should be really clear. Uh, but we're working, still banging away on them, trying to see if they're successful. But some of this was driven by uh, uh, GDC. I was on a uh, panel with Paul Bettner, uh, who's done a bunch of games, is a wonderful game designer, uh, much better than me. And he said, where is our Angry Birds? Where is our Candy Crush? Meaning for Web3. It can't all be core games. It can't all be CCGs or MOBAs or FPSs. At some point, you need your mid-core, your mid-casual games, but you need to make sure they're, they're, they work in Web3. So what is the twist in Web3? And in our case... It's NFTs that you acquire or buy, and then you can use them to win, and it's play to progress, no different than other games, in those games that are more casual games. And we aim those at markets like Southeast Asia, Nigeria, parts of Africa, where the competitive set is a little bit different. And people like the idea of a little bit of a money play, not gambling, but a little bit, there might be an idea this NFT, this asset could be worth more in addition to playing with it. And so that was the theory. So far, it's it's early. I wouldn't say we've I wouldn't say we've taken over the category. I wish we would have. We're still working on it a bit. But I still have the I still believe deeply whether we build it or somebody else builds it. There's room for casual to mid casual games that use digital assets in innovative ways. And there's always room for that in every new game platform. Yeah, I, I buy that, and that, that's I was definitely interested in hearing. About that at GDC when when you and I chatted, um, you know where are the casual games? Everybody's building these incredibly core games that are very complicated and very uh, time consuming, and everybody's pitching the AAA for Web three, but yep. those aren't actually. I mean, they monetize very well, and so I understand the the rationale for going down that path. A relatively small number of players are incredibly passionate and can spend a lot of money in those games, so they can be very very financially uh, rewarding for the developer, uh, even at relatively small scale. So I understand the logic. For sure, um, but there are no casual like there are just hardly any casual developers. Uh, nobody's making casual games. Nobody's integrating. Web3. Well, I think I, I also have another theory which not everybody likes, which is uh, putting my senior citizen hat on. Is that when you have a new platform, don't build a game that takes three or four years because you're on a new platform. By the time you deliver it, the platform has shifted because it's a new platform. Platforms stabilize in the types of games they like, the types of user interactions after three or four years. We're still too early. Start with smaller games that are fun and innovative, but you can iterate on them faster. And then about three or four or five years into a platform, new platform lifecycle, you build the big games. Mm -hmm. When you So for example, if you started two or three years ago building a massive game, you would have built Axie Infinity because that was the hot game at the time. And that's what everybody kind of was inspired by and was quite successful for a period of time. We It turned out in hindsight, it wasn't much of a game and isn't sustainable, but that's what you would have done. So start in the beginning, like my former colleague Owen at Facebook, who's got Infinigods, and he's got a series of smaller games that are using similar NFTs the way we did with our first party games that are merge games and simple uh, tower defense. And each of them is getting better because you can see him and his team learning what works in Web3. And that, I think, is a more successful outcome is to be iterative, move quickly, learn, and then build bigger each time. I'm not saying, listen, I hope these big games are successful. I really do. Uh, because the industry needs it. I just think it's highly risky and it's not what I would have done necessarily on a new and relatively unstable platform. 
where we're still figuring out what are the game methods that work, what are the consumer journeys that work, uh, and people are building you know three to four year uh, life cycle games. By the time they ship, it's a very different world than you started when you built the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, the just like just like right now, if you look at console. I just downloaded Baldur's Gate and I've got Starfield coming when my Xbox arrives for my son. You know, we're a few years into the cycle of this console. They didn't come out. These types of games didn't come out day one when the PS5 shipped. You needed time to build the game to understand the power of the, the platform and whether it's hardware or software. And then now we're three, four years into the new cycle and you're seeing these incredible games come out. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Whenever a new technology or a new platform, especially when a new platform emerges, it takes a while for their to become the maturity for developers to figure out what's possible, what's different about this technology or set of technologies. Um, on that note, uh, something I'm curious about, what form factor or, or platform do you see as the most likely path for Web3 success? Um, I mean, so presumably for casual games, you're talking about mobile um, or some kind of... So I'm not so sure. Um, interesting. So, interesting. I, okay. I, so at Facebook, I launched Instant Games. This was these were HTML5 games built into. I did my team did to be fair, but uh, they were they were built into the Messenger platform, and it was super cool. It was great, and it didn't end up being that successful at scale because Apple fought it tooth and nail, just like Apple's fighting tooth and nail Web3. And so it doesn't mean it won't get there. It just means that the mobile platforms, both Android and Apple, by the nature of their control make it hard for innovative technology and innovative business models to show up. And by the time you're done making compromises to fit those amazing platforms, you've compromised the game. So my personal view is you should start on PC. Hmm. You should start on laptop, PC, web. It is still a thriving business. It is a good size business. Uh, And then over time, you go to mobile web. uh, And then over time, you fight to be in the app store. The folks we talk with a lot, I hope they're really successful being in the App Store, but coming back from Korea this week, I think the Koreans have it right, which is the App Store game is a total Web 2 game. The Web 3 part of it is on a website that is not directly linked from the game. Look at a game like League of Kingdoms. However, the game gamers inside the chat rooms and the guild start talking about it, and they drive people out to that website where you can pick up more powerful items or different types of NFTs. So I think that is the better outcome. I think trying to fight your way through the thicket of regulations on the two different app stores, which have different regulations Mm -hmm. and still have a consistent game is going to be really hard. I don't think the the end game is clearly mobile. I want to be crystal clear, but the app stores aren't necessarily ready for it yet. So I'd rather see people build games on web, which is the most open platform, whether it's PC or mobile. And then over time, then as that becomes more successful and we learn things, move it into the app store. But mobile is still the end game, no question. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I would say contrarian, but uh, but certainly uh, maybe not what developers want to hear. <laughs> a lot of developers want to skip well, skip to the end game, right? Which is obviously I best. had all of Facebook's clout behind me, and we were unable to win. So, <laughs> yeah, no, <that's- laughs> so you know, so I, I worry about other folks without that level of uh, influence. So I'm not saying we won't get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Apple and Google are great partners. They evolve over time. They have in real money gaming. They have in casino and you know, other things. It just takes time. Uh, they have existing business models, existing rules, some of which are well thought out, some of which are not. And they want to slow this down while they figure it out. And I just worry about folks trying to push ahead to the end game, as you said, versus working with what we have, which is a pretty vibrant, you know, 24% of the revenue of 200 billion revenue is in PC, whether it's downloadable PC or mobile. And the Epic Game Store is quite amenable to Web3 games, Steam, not so much. Mm -hmm. But, you know, over time, we find how to build businesses in those categories. And then we spread to the more amenable platforms as they evolve. Yeah, that's a smart approach, Go. Um, so you, you've been uh, in the Web3 waters for about 18 months now um, and presumably had some view from at the Facebook level looking at the blockchain initiatives that mm-hmm. were that were happening um, before that even. Um, what have you learned along the way? Uh, you know, Web3 has these metas that keep ch- changing every, mm-hmm. it seems like every month, <laughs> really. Yeah, things move very fast in Web3. Um, and what was supposedly true last month is no longer true now, and what's true now is no longer true next month. Um, but some some universal truths, I think, have emerged. Uh, what have you learned along the way? What are you seeing that is interesting? 
I think the core premise, as I talk about a lot, asset ownership still will be the winner in the end, much more so than the other aspects of decentralization, DAOs, tokens, et cetera. I think asset ownership alone is powerful enough. So that doesn't change. I think the game fi, and a term I just hate, mm. uh, game fi and other ways to financialize a game actually detract from its entertainment uh, side. It doesn't mean it's bad. People, There are all sorts of financial games. People trade stocks, they trade equities and futures. It's just traditionally not successful as an entertainment medium. And the reason that makes it hard is as soon as you financialize a game, think about Animal Crossing, a wonderful game for Nintendo. And if Animal Crossing, if you had a Web3 version of it and you mispriced apples and bananas, then everybody would soon sell apples and buy bananas. And they would stop playing the game. They would just sell apples and buy bananas because they can make money from it. And so in Web3, the problem with Web3, which makes it more challenging, is you have to balance your economy. Balancing an economy in Web2 is hard enough, but at least there's no direct cash out, not an easy cash out. In Web3, as soon as you have a hole in your economy, meaning your faucet and your uh, drain do not have the same balance, then people take advantage of it. You get arbitrage very quickly, and the game becomes less fun because everybody's just arbitraging that thing they can do in the game. So that's challenging. People really have to focus on economy design more so in Web3 because of the cash out options. But I still believe, and we've seen this with Diablo 3 and other earlier attempts at this, that the ability, the power that comes to consumers from being able to own and buy and sell assets like they do in the real world will be over time, people will say, why the hell did I play FIFA when I couldn't own those assets? Right now, if I was following Messi, I would want to sell my Argentina cards and buy my Inter Miami cards. I can't really do that. The only thing I do in FIFA is just keep buying and buying. Now, we have lots of friends who have lots of money, so they can do that. But in general purposes, that's not the way it should work. So I still think that's what we've learned is you got to balance your economy better. The game has to be fun, not about game fi. Not saying some people, collectors will still be in your game if you have a game fi game. But that's not a big audience. I mean, if we look at it, we're at roughly less than a million unique active wallets per day in Web3 gaming versus 3.2 billion monthly users in, in the real world. So for us to get to the next 100 million, that next 500 million, we're going to need mass market to come in. That means the games must be entertaining first and foremost. I do worry about tokens. So tokens, I think I was really into tokens when I first joined Web3 because I thought it's a way to reward early stage uh, consumers of your game or app in a way you couldn't really get at Facebook or other types of apps. The problem you run into is your most loyal gamers are the ones who buy your tokens. And if they go down in value, which most of them have, then you have your gamers, your most loyal gamers are unhappy because they are all in on you and they've just lost half of what they invested. We can debate security law or not, but in general, you've got your most loyal gamers are least happy even though the game could be super fun. It's just they lost money in the token. So I'm a little down on tokens these days uh, just because I think it's another part of the economy you have to manage that isn't related to is the game fun. Mm -hmm. now, and so although I see benefits to it, I just, I just worry about it. And I want to come back to fun games that allow consumers to buy, sell, and trade, not financialize the entire thing that are a variety of genres and that have an easy on-ramp wallet process that doesn't seem so scary then we're going to be golden. Okay. Uh, uh, you chose to build on Immutable um, and presumably had your, your reasons for that. You didn't choose another uh, Layer 2. And of course, as we uh, you said yourself, uh, this notion of Layer 2s and Layer 1s is very confusing mm -hmm. to, the, to the average person, certainly a, a casual gamer who really could care less what's going on under the hood. Um, you also chose not to build on another competing Layer 1 um, that's arguably more performant, although obviously smaller and sort of market cap, mm -hmm. if you will, like Solana, Binance, Smart Chain. Um, why did you choose Immutable uh, as your as your choice? So we partially chose Immutable because we inherited it. It was the when we, when we got the prototype because it was God's Unchained. But also they've been a great partner. Yeah. So Immutable really has focused on how do we again simplify this process, focus only on games, not on PFPs or other types of things. Uh, and how do we get something? And, and Robbie and James and Alex, the co-founders, who are wonderful partners, have really focused on how do we be the leading game platform in Web3. And so they've been a great partner. They, we, we are their preferred marketplace of choice for embedded games. So we really enjoy that relationship. What I'd say it also is you know, relatively cost effective, fast, but also they're building a set of tools like their upcoming Passport Wallet, which is really going to be helpful to mainstreaming games. We also support Polygon. So we do support Polygon, we, we support Ethereum, of course, and we do look at other chains. It, we're not chain exclusive to Mutable. 
it just the way I look at chains is there was the first generation of change, which is BNB Binance and Wax. And the, by the way, they still have the bulk of the, the gamers today, uh, but they're much older games. Then you have this next generation, which, uh, which are the L2s like Polygon and Ethereum. You have, you have uh, Avalanche, you have Solana. And it's a little bit fragmented, but our view is when we look at it is that the bulk of the games that are coming are going to be on that alliance between Polygon and Immutable. That was a very clever partnership they did to where Polygon ended up with the tech for ZK AVM that Immutable is going to use, and Immutable ended up with the games from Polygon. So they, from my point of view, are the leader, at least in the West, uh, the East is a bit different, for Web2, and the bulk of the games we see coming are coming on that combination. For the next generation, the Aptos, the Mistons, the whole set of chains that keep coming, I think it's really TBD. And those are colleagues of mine from Facebook who spun out to do that, and there's some really interesting attributes to those chains. It's not clear from a gaming developer perspective or consumer perspective why you would need that. So I think we're going to see the main uh, discussion be about this current set of chains. And I believe Immutable with Polygon's partnership will be the winner in this category and have the bulk of the games that are coming out. But to your point, no one should care. Right. I was, no one should I ask. was just going to say that. You know, no, one should, no one should ask. Right. I mean, I don't ask. When, when I play FIFA, I don't ask, did they use the Oracle database or the MongoDB? Exactly. Did they use Unity? Did they use Unreal? No consumer should care. So I think, but I think Immutable does a good job of abstracting that. And I think other chains and our wallet and our direct buy offer are doing that. We need to abstract the complexity away. If it's under the hood, that's great. The fact that HTTP is under the internet browser hood doesn't matter to anybody, really, except for the people who build things. So we need to get away from complexity and stop thinking that consumers care about core technology. Developers do, and it's important to build it. But we need to abstract it away and get back to, is it fun? Is it performant? Is it easy to use? Uh, do I feel safe when I use it? You know, those are the things we need to get back to, which you need the underlying technology to enable, but consumers shouldn't see it or feel it. No, that's exactly right. Uh, and th th this is my view as well. Consumers absolutely should not care what chain you're built on, and they shouldn't even care that you're built on any chain. They shouldn't. The chain should be invisible. Yep. Which is why I asked at the very the top of the hour that we we started this. I asked you, you know, whether you see it as a set of technologies that developers can use or as something more fundamental. Because I'm I vacillate between the two. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm like nobody's going to care that this is a blockchain enabled game. They're just going to care about whatever the outcome is that that enables, right? Whether it's digital ownership or something else, right? That we haven't seen yet. Um, and so I'm, I'm somewhere in between. I'm, I'm whether blockchain technologies, web three technologies just become something invisible under the hood that developers use, uh, you know, like, any other set of technologies, whether it be integrating an SDK that does analytics or, you know, integrating, you know, building on Unity because you get the asset store or whatever that something might be, uh, or Unreal Engine versus something else. That's not something consumers and gamers are ever going to care about. They might care about the, the ownership, but they're still not going to care which chain you're built on. So I guess where I'm going with this is how do we get to a place, in your view, where that is actually the way games that are enabled through Reddit 3 or digital ownership games uh, can be that invisible to the end consumer. Every year is better. You know, our new direct buy option is much better than what we had before we had to buy Ethereum. You know, the new passport wallet from Immutable is better than what MetaMask has. It's not so, I think people get a little impatient about the evolution of how already we're better off than a year or two ago when it was so hard to get into this. Mm -hmm. So as we see the evolution, it's getting better because companies like ours and others are focusing on abstracting that away. You know, I spend a lot of time with CSGO marketplaces because it's the closest analog in many ways to Web3. It's just one game, but you enable the trading of skins at high volume, much higher volume than Web3. Uh, and you have lots of marketplaces and pricing and, and all sorts of market making and all sorts of things going on there. But it's still hard. Because CSGO doesn't officially allow it. So there's still friction in that process. And still, it's a massive business because the game is amazing. Now, when we get into Web3 and we start abstracting that hardness away, that friction away, because the games are built from day one to enable it, the wallets and the overall marketplaces are much smoother. You don't ask about the chain. You just buy the game and it shows up. You don't worry about what the, what's behind the chain. That is coming pretty quickly. And that's why 2024 is exciting. Because I think we all agree that there's too many steps in the process. Uh, but if you've got a great game, and I will say a great game trumps all. CSGO has friction in the process. It's a great game. 
If I look at, you know, some of the Riot games, they're impossible to get into in Web 2. I get killed every single time I've been there in League of Legends, yet they have been incredibly successful because the game is great. So we need a combination of great games built with this new economy in mind, as well as making it easier for everybody to come into. You can't make everybody be a PhD or an, uh, an economics professor in order to get into the game. Yeah. But I feel good about 2024. I feel good about Asia, Japan, and Korea in particular. Uh, the types of games I saw last week in Korea are phenomenal. So I feel good. It's just taking a little bit longer than I think we had all hoped. Yeah, you've teased this uh, Korea or an Asian gaming uh, Web3 market a little bit here. What are they doing right? What are they yeah. doing differently to uh, Western developers? You, you know, it's fascinating. What you see in the West is just like you saw in Free to Play is none of the mainstream publishers are playing. Yes, we'll call out one Take-Two game from Zynga out of the 72 games they have coming or one game from Ubisoft mm -hmm. out of the 40 games they have coming. So let's not get too excited. When I'm in Korea, as I was last week, every major middle and small publisher is doing Web3 games. It's not the only thing they're doing. We talked to Nexon. They have 300 people working on, you know, Cartwrighter, MapleStory, et cetera. You talk to NHN, NeoWiz, you know, all the... By the way, this is in a country where blockchain games are not allowed. Mm. So uh, people seem to forget that, that in Korea, currently under government rules, all games have to be approved by the government or at least given a rating. You cannot play blockchain games in Korea. Yet every game developer and publisher we talk to is building them because they see it as the next wave. They see it as a way to uh, monetize whales at a better level, a way to bring more fun into the process, given some of the ability to buy, sell, and trade. Japan, we see the same thing, which I used to work in Japan. Not always the most innovative uh, country on software. Government fully supporting Web3 and seeing you know, Square Enix and Sega and a bunch of folks, not the only thing they're doing, I want to be crystal clear, but have full development efforts there where we're not seeing it as much here where we're seeing small and medium-sized developers doing it. Here, the Take-Twos and the Ubisofts and the EAs, uh, not so much because the business isn't big enough. It's not big enough yet and it's disruptive. They shouldn't do anything for five or six years because that's the question I always get. Why aren't the big players doing anything? Well, if you look at Take-Two and you look at EA, their big acquisitions in free-to-play were two years ago. That was 12 years into the cycle. EA bought Glue, Take-Two bought Zynga. They did some smaller ones before that. And now Activision was a little bit earlier with King. And by the way, a brilliant, brilliant transaction in Web2 in free-to-play. So big publishers take time. But in Asia, the big publishers are all in there anyway, with at least a significant team building things because they think it's the most innovative way, the next wave of gaming. Might be right, might be wrong. We think we think they're right. But I love to see that. And that's why going to Asia was so energizing. Where the, here in the West, it could be a little bit frustrating sometimes. Yeah, I mean, uh, Asia oftentimes has been at the forefront uh, of gaming. You know, a lot of the trends. And they were with free to play. Right, they, they were absolutely worried. They were with free to play. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And Eric and Eric Betke and I were talking about this. Who used to live in Korea mm -hmm. with uh, his pet company. Even in avatars and virtual yeah. worlds, it really came out of Korea. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the mechanics um, from the most successful games in free to play today that you look at, you know, in the West and and in in Asia came from Asia initially, usually about a year or two. Uh, absolutely. A year or two late. I remember us looking at Zynga, you know, early mobile, we were like, okay, what, you know, Zynga totally missed the boat to mobile for exactly the reasons you're yep. saying, which is it was making so much money <laughs> on the Facebook Canvas business. Yes, it was. It was very yep. hard. It's very hard to pivot or even put any resources against this new thing. What is this new thing? Who's going to play the games on their mobile devices? You can't monetize there at all. Like, look how much money we're yep. making on poker and Farmville and Mafia Wars. Like, there, nobody's going to yep. spend those kinds of amounts. Well, you know, that's why the startups succeed. So, so I absolutely, that thesis around, you know, the smaller companies, uh, the smallest startups are going to be the innovators in this space, initially not going to make huge amounts of money, maybe not even have big audiences. But over time, we will collectively as an industry figure out, oh, these mechanics work, these mechanics don't. Uh, and a lot of the time, uh, as we saw with free-to-play, Asia is incredibly innovative um, yeah. around these things. And why do you think that is, by the way? Um, is, is there... Because the you know, one, one is... Uh, governments don't really... Yeah. like. It's not, to your point, blockchain gaming is illegal or not allowed, at least. In, in China in right. China and Korea. Yeah. So, and yet you're saying they're innovating uh, there. It's really interesting. It's kind of a paradox. Yeah, a couple things. So one is you just have incredibly great game developers across those three countries in particular, especially the ones in Korea and China. I used to go to China Joy in Shanghai. Uh, are just lower cost structure, incredibly aggressive, able to roll out faster, iterate faster, try new business models, shut them down, start new ones. And so that level of uh, speed and ability to deliver 
Uh, as well as you see in Western games, the games tend to be more complicated and they tend to be higher monetizing. What you see is a much harsher climate in classic Western games, where when your village gets overrun in a real-time strategy, it's dead. It doesn't grow back gradually the way all Western games do. You have to go rebuy it. I mean, it's not. Mm. So they've always had a what I would describe in free-to-play as a more uh, play-to-win. People hate that term here, play-to-progress, if that makes people feel better. But the answer is most of life is play-to-win and play-to-progress. Uh, you can only sell so many skins and so many games. And Asia has always had more of that. And so Web3 is a much more natural part of that, where it's asset ownership by sell trade, uh, as opposed to because those games that were built there often had a more aggressive monetization strategy than you see in the supercell like West or Zynga or so on. doesn't mean it's bad. They're just different. And that's why, by the way, many of the, the Asian games have not worked very well in the West. Partially, it's the style. Partially, it's the mechanics. Then all of a sudden you see the Genshin impacts and then ones coming out of China right now that have been able to make that work. So uh, we do see, I do see Asia as always being an innovator. Content doesn't always work in the West, but certainly the business models and, and the way they iterate and uh, is impressive to watch. And I hope that here in the West that we have enough great new games coming, which I think we do in 2024, that across a wide set of genres that will be able to be successful. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, so, last question for our our uh, time before our time is up. Uh, what are your predictions now for the next? You've touched on a, uh, some of these throughout. With they've yep. been interspersed in the answers, but what what are your kind of predictions for what happens in the next year? Uh, you know, three years, five years, and then you know, a decade from now. Uh, I think, and, and one of the so think, one of the lenses I want you to I want you to look mm -hmm. th this through is. I, you know, I mentioned the chicken and egg piece, right? There was a huge uh, uh, inflow of, of money, VC money, into Web3 gaming on the back of Axie Infinity because there was so much money being made, right? That obviously proved to be very unsustainable. And of course, as you well know, we're now in a lull. Um, there are going to be yeah, yeah, yes, we there are, are going to be there are going to be some casualties <laughs> along the way. I think we have to recognize mm -hmm. that, and that's fine. That's totally normal in a in a gold rush, right? There are always winners, you know, losers, and actual casualties, literally, um, on, on the road. Um, but what do we need to see? This is the lens I want to put on this. What do we need to see for there to be a true, real Web3 uh, gaming ecosystem that's thriving, that is taking advantage of digital ownership and potentially other aspects of, of what we call Web3 without the VC dollars that are going to be very hard to come by for at least the next year, I would have thought, right? So... Oh, I, I I agree. How do we how do we bridge a the couple gaps? Is, is what I'm I, I guess what I'm asking. Yeah. So one is there were billions of dollars invested into Web three content over the last three years. I can't remember the exact number, but it's billions. And now those many of those games are still coming to fruition. So over the next one to two years, the investments from one to three years ago will start to hit. So they're funded. They're funded. There's some amazing games coming that are in development that from great game developers, not folks who made some money and decided to make games. And so, so that I feel good about. I feel good about the set of games already funded that are coming. I feel good about, again, wallets, marketplaces, et cetera, all getting better. There's no magic bullet here. This is not the one magic game that's going to save the earth. It's not how it works. What you find is that you just see games start to pop up that people enjoy that go from 10,000 players a day to 50,000 players a day, then 100,000 players a day, not a million or 10 million or 100 million. I was just looking back at the old Cityville numbers. Cityville peaked at 16 million DAU. Yeah. Really, by the way, this is on a Facebook desktop platform, I like to tell people. Mm -hmm. This is before the phone. 16 million DAU on a desktop platform when Facebook only had 500 million DAU total or uh, MAU total. So it is possible for games, what I was telling people, it is possible for games to blow up quickly. Uh, and so if they're fun and if, they're, if they've got good social mechanics and, and they make money and they can be analyzed and therefore then acquired. So I think what we're going to see is a couple of things. One is better games will continue to ship from those that, that what was funded before. Wallets, uh, purchasing, all that gets easier. So we abstract away much of the Web3. That happens in 2024. That's the great news. I don't see a lot of mobile love in 2024. I see that coming probably three years later where the app stores start to open up a bit. This just takes time. They're not because they're bad people. They just have existing business models and a lot, a lot going on there. So, And then you go out to the five to 10-year time frame, and in every game, you own the assets. You buy, sell, trade. It's just part of what you would do because you, assuming comparable games, 
you wouldn't play a game where you couldn't do that because that wouldn't seem fair. And so therefore, game developers have to adjust. It doesn't mean the rest of the economy goes away. Just like we still have wonderful single player console games where they're not social, they don't have DLC, they don't have, you know, if you look at uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild, that is a single player old school game in many ways, you know, and it's amazing. It doesn't mean that free to play has destroyed that. It's just expanded it. So, but I do believe that we'll see more consumers come into games where you can own in the five-year time frame. Am I worried about venture capital funding? Oh yeah, for any of those who need funding right now, but I still see a wave of games coming. And then once those games are successful, venture starts to open up again, as do the traditional publishers. So in that five to 10 year time frame, traditional publishers all have Web3, or we don't even call it Web3, it's just part of the fabric that some assets you can own and trade and some you can't. Mm-hmm. And those are very clearly delineated. So that's what I think we'll see over the next kind of one, three, five year time frames. But it's going to be a little rough if you're not well funded at the moment. And because we're still a little flat on game player at the moment until we see those next set of games hit. I love the optimism, Sean. Uh, you've seen a lot uh, in the, over the years, and obviously you've seen it at massive scale at, at Facebook. So that's why I wanted to have you on the pod to, to get your perspective. And I love the fact that you're optimistic uh, about the future. So um, that's a great place to end. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for coming on the pod uh, and giving us your perspective on what Web3 looks like and where it's going. Perfect, Nico. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation. I'm glad we could continue it from the last time we met. Absolutely. And a big thank you to all of our listeners. We'll be back next week with more interviews, more insights, and more analysis from the weird and wonderful world of Web3. Until next time, friends, stay crypto curious and feel free to send questions, guest recommendations, and comments to me. My email is nico at novic.co. And you can find me on Twitter at, I still call it Twitter. I still call it Twitter. I should call it X at Nico the Finn. <laughs> DMs are always open. Threads, baby. Move to threads. Come on. All the cool kids are. (laughs) All right. On that note, uh, thank you, everyone. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.